So now let me continue uh, this um, journey through Indian science in, in a, uh, still in an overview mode, but uh, nevertheless there are a few important things we need to see. Uh, incidentally, this is a manuscript of Bhaskaracharya, whom we are starting with today. Uh, we saw all, a few very briefly great scientists uh, last time, such as Aryabhata, Brahmagupta, um, and Bhaskara the first, who was in the seventh century and who wrote a massive commentary on Aryabhata. But Bhaskaracharya, also called Bhaskara the second, is another Bhaskara who lived in the twelfth century. So this, and he's the author of, as you will see, several works, including the famous Leelavati. And this is a manuscript of the Leelavati. Uh, again, as I said last time, not an original manuscript. All manuscripts we have, even if they are a bit ancient, like maybe 200 years, uh, they, they are copies and not, uh, not even first, second or third copies, but you know, these have been copied many times. So this is therefore Bhaskaracharya, and uh, you can see the date of birth, and you can note that uh, this year is the 900th birth anniversary of Bhaskaracharya, and there have been a number of events in India to celebrate that. Uh, the, in fact, there is one coming at the end of November in Pune, University of Pune and ISA are jointly hosting a big conference on history of uh, mathematics. And there will be speakers from all over the world. They will be from uh, America, France, New Zealand, uh, a couple of other countries, and of course, quite a few from India. It's going to be a four-day conference. Anybody interested can mail me and I will mail the post uh, in, in uh, reply. So his uh, <coughs> place of birth is a little bit disputed. It doesn't matter much for, from our point of view. But uh, it is either Maharashtra or northern Karnataka. There are two candidates. It doesn't uh, matter much. Um, in fact, because those states were not defined in, the, in this manner in those days. So the, the, the names of the regions were very different. So fine. Uh, his major work is actually not Leelavati, it is Siddhanta Shiromani, and the pinnacle, the, the uh, head uh, jewel, literally speaking, of the Siddhantas, that is to say, of scientific texts. So he's, in fact, it's a little bit of a boastful uh, title. He's telling us that this is the best, and, and actually for centuries it's going to be the best books of Indian mathematics and astronomy, where he goes beyond uh, all his predecessors. For example, he improved <coughs> on Brahmagupta's algebra, algebraic method to solve those, if you remember from last time, those equations that demand solutions as integers. You cannot, you, you cannot uh, look for real solutions, otherwise it's just too easy. We would have obviously infinities of solutions. Um, you, ha you need to get integers. This is because of the astronomical background to these equations where you're dealing with integral numbers of orbits of planets within certain times. So in fact, um, uh, 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 Brahmagupta's method was called the Bhavana and it was an algorithm that is there are only algorithmic solutions to those equations. You cannot have instant formulas like you would have for say the, the classic quadratic equation. And, um, uh, but his method, which I, I will not be detailing, it's a complex series of steps where you play on the coefficients of the equations. Uh, it's very fast, economical, but still there are 11 or 12 uh, steps to be. And uh, uh, he actually uh, put himself this equation and he gave these two solutions, so you can see the complexity of the calculations, as being the smallest solutions. Because once you get a pair of solutions in such equations, you can always uh, build up rapidly new pairs of solutions. It's not very difficult. And in fact, it was Brahmagupta who gave a demonstration that once you have one pair of solutions, you have an infinity, potentially an infinity of solutions. Lagrange, the French mathematician of, I think, 18th century, is it 18th or or early 19th, maybe across the, the two centuries, actually came upon the same equation and, uh, uh, and of course, solved it in the, uh, with the same result. 
except that Lagrange uh, um, algorithm was not as economical as uh, Bhaskaracharya's. So this is just to show how, <coughs> yeah, 18th century, sorry. <coughs> this is just to show you how, um, you know, the time lag between the development of mathematics in India and that in Europe. Solutions to cubic and biquadratic equations, not a complete treatment of that, but uh, uh, some methods which worked. And a, a, a fairly, for the first time possibly in India, though it is there potentially in the Aryabhata, but not explicitly, here it is explicit. Bhaskaracharya discusses the variations of speed of the, the planet. Because you see, the, <coughs> the speed of the the motion of a planet in its orbit is not uniform, as you know. And there are sections where it goes faster, sections where it goes uh, more slowly. So they notice this. This is easily noticeable. And it, in fact, it was one major problem for ancient astronomers all over the world. Because uh, initially, in Greece, even in India, they wanted orbits to be circular. And they wanted motions to be uniform. because. You know, you, you would assume that uh, n uh, nature is perfect and uh, that uh, this is what you should have. But then, then the motions do not match those expectations. And then lots of complicated uh, solutions have to be, uh, rather complications have to be uh, integrated, such as the notion of epicycles. You know what are epicycles? There are small circles that the planets are supposed to be orbiting uh, uh, with, but the, the, and it is not, and, and the center of that epicycle is actually uh, having a uniform motion. So through such complications, the Greeks, even the Babylonians before, to a small extent, and uh, uh, the Indians, the Chinese too, were trying to reconcile, you know, a perfect theory, but wrong, a wrong one, with the facts of nature. So, <coughs> so then. In studying the variations of the speed of the uh, planets, Brahm, uh, Brahmacharya comes up with the, uh, the, the variation, he calls it specifically, and he studies uh, minute variations, minute variations, and he comes upon the notion of derivative. Uh, he's done a lot of other work which I will not list uh, on mathematics, but just to show you the difficulty and rather the, the progressive nature of uh, um, scientific discovery. You see, again, as I said last time, there are some people who uh, over-enthusiastically would like a, a Bhaskara or an Aryabhata to be omniscient. It is not the case. If you take the question of the volume of the sphere, uh, you may skip the quotations and see directly the results. Uh, this is the result for uh, Aryabhata. And uh, well, it's wrong. It's, uh, it's wrong by uh, quite a bit, in fact. Mahavira is closer to the, who was a Jain mathematician, very brilliant mathematician. I have not had time to mention his contributions in detail. Comes to a fairly uh, closer result. Then Sridhara, another brilliant mathematician of the uh, ninth century. And there is an Aryabhata the second, whom I did not mention. Uh, uh, propose this one, which is uh, clo even closer to the actual result, but it is Bhaskaracharya who gives finally the correct solution, <coughs> which is of course uh, 4 by, th by 3 pi r cube. So that's for roughly 4 by 4.19. So you can see the progression, and they're coming closer and closer. And uh, <coughs> of course, he doesn't put it that way because those notations do not exactly. Uh, exists like this. He says the sphere's surface multiplied by its diameter and divided by 6. And when you do the, the calculation, you come to exactly this formula. How did it come to this result? By a kind of integral calculus process. Integral calculus did not exist in Bhaskaracharya time, but there were some components building up towards it. And what he does is that he slices the the sphere into infinitesimal slices, and then he can calculate for each very, very small slice the volume, and then he can add it up. So it's a, it's a, 
uh, uh, it slices it like uh, you know an orange if you, if you know the way the orange is uh, that's what I mean not horizontally and uh, this is how he calculates by taking very very small slices so now back to Leelavati Leelavati why this name in Leelavati we have as you will see <coughs> a lot of mathematical problem it's actually to my perception it's uh, it's almost like a, a textbook of mathematics, or rather of exercises of mathematics, designed for the st to stimulate the student. And all of them, as you will see in the next slide, are designed in a highly poetical manner with uh, metaphors, with the stories happening. It's, it's, uh, it's, a very, uh, it's, it's a work of genius from the pedagogical point of view. Uh, but then the problems are, usually put in the form, Oli Lavati, give me the solution. You see, this is usually how the problem ends. Lilavati, fair lady, give me the solution to this problem. Now, who was Lilavati? Bhaskaracharya does not tell us. Uh, it is a lady, that's all we know. Or it is a metaphor for something. But there is a legend uh, coming, which uh, actually is uh, from the biographer, uh, Abdul Fazl, the biographer of Akbar. And... Uh, uh, his book in Persian mentions that this Leelavati is actually the daughter of Bhaskaracharya. Now, we, we don't know. We have no, absolutely no source to confirm. It doesn't seem very likely from the kind of language that Bhaskaracharya himself uses. But the story is that when she was, uh, uh, Bhaskaracharya was also supposedly a fine astrologer and had drawn the horoscope of his daughter. And he found that uh, he, if she was to marry at all, there was only one brief auspicious window of time that she could use. Otherwise, the marriage would be catastrophic. So she, he told her, and he told her that, look, you use this Ghati Yantra, which, as you might remember from last time, is a ball of water floating on, uh, a, a ball floating on water, on a small basin of, filled with water. And this, hole, this ball has a hole uh, calibrated in such a way that this, it will fill up and sink after 24 minutes, which is uh, what is known as a ghati, so in, in, in uh, mathematical parlance. So he gives her this water clock, and he says, you watch the time. There is only one auspicious time. Don't miss it. Otherwise, I would suggest you don't marry. So she watches it, and, they, and you, this is the, the bridegroom. And, uh, but, then, but then, as you can see, there is a small white dot here, and she has not noticed what one pearl of her, uh, uh, you know, uh, dress uh, has fallen into the bowl and blocked the hole. So therefore, water cannot rise, or it rises in a, uh, you know, in a wrong manner. And the auspicious time is missed, so she cannot marry. Finally, she renounces marriage, and then she is disconsolate. And to console her, Bhaskaracharya composes this Leelavati, this series of stimulating uh, exercises, uh, problems, riddles, if you, if you prefer. Today, we might also call them brain teasers, uh, you know, to keep her anguish. I mean, this is the, the legend that comes much later, centuries after Bhaskaracharya, uh, which he probably would have been very surprised at himself. But anyway, these are some examples uh, to just show you. And, and you know, these, these, uh, these problems of mathematics are perfectly valid problems. And we could use exactly the same text today in schools. In fact, there are some schools that do use them. So for example, this one, a beautiful pearl necklace of a youthful lady was torn in a love quarrel. And the pearls were all scattered on the floor. One third of the number of pearls was on the floor, and one fifth on the bed. One sixth was found by the pretty lady. One tenth was collected by the lover. And six pearls were seen hanging in the thread. Tell me the total number of pearls in the necklace. So there's, of course, no difficulty in solving that. But you can see how much more entertaining this would be for uh, some of our school children. Let me show you just two other examples, which are a little more complicated, and of course, still quite basic, but uh, maybe that was class four or five, I don't know, uh, but this would be a little uh, beyond. One man says to another, if I give you 100 rupees, I shall be twice as rich as you are. 
The other replies, if you give me 10 rupees, I shall be six times as rich as you are. Tell me the wealth of each of them. And so extremely simple, of course, but still uh, put in, in an entertaining manner. A merchant started with a sum. Entering a city, he paid 10 rupees as duty. After trading, his amount became double. From that, he spent 10 rupees on dinner and left the city after paying 10 rupees as duty. He went on to two other cities. The same was the case in both of them. After coming back, his amount had trebled. What was the initial sum? So, I mean, I wish, in fact, at a plus two board exam, we would put, you know, uh, out of the blue one such problem and see really how many can solve it. Because, you know, when you put problems today in an unexpected uh, formula, if you formulate it differently from the textbook, usually people are lost. So, so uh, this would be an interesting experiment to make. He has a lot of uh, problems also on calculation of interest, compounded interest, all kinds of, then geometrical problems. Basically, he touches upon all the disciplines of uh, uh, basic mathematics. And uh, <coughs> uh, we know that uh, he was well known in his time because, in fact, uh, his son is mentioned. We don't know whether he had a daughter, but we know that he had a son. His son is mentioned in one inscription um, uh, uh, in the Maharashtra region. And um, uh, in fact, there are many inscriptions, hundreds and thousands possibly, that mention um, astronomical facts like eclipses or, or some peculiar phenomenon, or that mention the patronage that a king is extending to an astronomer. This is for, uh, the reason you can see, in fact, here uh, an inscription from the 12th century, more or less at the time of Bhaskaracharya, where one king uh, rewards an astronomer named Padmanabha for predicting a total lunar eclipse uh, correctly. And uh, this is important because it shows that the social function of those astronomers, you see, it is not as if they lived completely cut off from the, the society. They had, first of all, by developing mathematics, they could contribute to calculation methods, which uh, people at large could use. Uh, the decimal system also was used widely in India, and it was, after all, something which uh, these mathematicians worked out. But then, at the astronomical level, people were not much concerned, it is true, with the motion, you know, the detailed uh, 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 discussions on the motions of planets, but they were concerned with eclipses quite a lot because uh, these, as you know, had a very uh, important religious uh, function. Uh, you know that even today in India, people uh, will often, uh, I mean, religious people will often fast or have a bath and so on uh, on the day of an eclipse. So therefore, uh, an astronomer who was able to accurately predict an eclipse uh, was, you know, his fame was guaranteed. And um, he was often acknowledged in such inscriptions. We have now, uh, there is um, Professor B.V. Subarayappa, who is a doyen of uh, history of Indian science in association with Mayung Vahaya of TIFR, are publishing very shortly a big book listing all Indian inscriptions uh, with some astronomical input. So this is going to be a very interesting document to give us a better view of the social interface between those astronomers and, and the Indian society. I want to read out this slightly longish quotation because it, um, this is about a, a French astronomer in the 18th, late 18th century. His name is Le Gentil. And, uh, well, he has a very, very long name with lots of first and second and third names, but the last one is the one which is used. And he came to India because he wanted to observe the transit of Venus. You know that transits of Venus, that is to say the passage of Venus in front of the solar disk, happens in, in pair of eight years apart. And then you have to wait for another century or more before it recurs. So once you have one transit of Venus, in fact, the second, uh, a few years ago, we had the second of a pair. Uh, you know that eight years later, it happens again. This is due to the irregularities in the orbit of Venus. And uh, this was of great importance 
to the European astronomers because they were trying to measure the parallax. That is to say, basically it comes to the distance of Earth to Sun, very precisely. It is, it, you, the two things are interconnected. And uh, the transit of Venus gave a very, very good, uh, you could also use orbits of other planets, but this was actually a much better, uh, more, more uh, calibrated way to get the, the distance of um, Earth to the Sun. And um, so they, the Europeans sent during the, this and even a century earlier, but this 18th century is very famous because the Royal uh, Astronomical Society of London, then the, the, the corresponding French and if I remember well Dutch and German societies sent uh, astronomers in various parts of the world. Some went to the Americas, some went to Asia, uh, Far East, the Philippines, to, and perhaps Australia to, to do the measurements and then correlate all this to get a very secure de data. And uh, so the Lejeune in fact, um, went to the Philippines for, to observe the first, but then his, bo his ship was delayed. And actually, when the first transit occurred, he was on the boat, he was on the deck. He observed it, but he, you cannot make measurements on a moving ship. So he thought that instead of going back to France, he will go, come to, he will wait a little bit here and there, and finally uh, do it from Pondicherry, which was going to be a good point for observation. So that was to be on 1768. Unfortunately, while the, the whole night before the transit was perfectly, there was an absolutely clear sky uh, with all stars shining brightly, in the morning when Venus was about to move on to the solar disk, there was a cloud that came and which blocked the view. And uh, many other parts of the world, this was, uh, the, the transit was well observed. But the British also in, in uh, uh, what was Madras in those days had set up a small observatories and in fact they had lent a telescope to Le Gentil in Pondicherry and they also could not observe it. So he was bitterly disappointed but he used those years to make a lot of observations on the Indian society as he perceived it from Pondicherry. He didn't travel out of Pondicherry. Uh, and then one day, one day a local astronomer rather, you know, Jyotish, as we would call him today, probably astronomer come astrologer, uh, came to him, uh, he was brought to him, and <coughs> uh, uh, he, they had a discussion, and there was going to be a lunar eclipse shortly uh, afterwards, if I remember well, and uh, he, f he asked this man whether he could calculate, and, uh, you know, he answered that yes, and he was, of course, using all the techniques that had been honed by all these uh, astronomers we have talked about. And then he found that this man was calculating very fast and uh, he could not understand at all what was behind all these calculations. And some part of the calculations were done uh, mentally, uh, uh, others were done consulting some tables and finally within minutes he came with the result. And he calculated later on in the Newtonian fashion, which had been by then adopted by European astronomers, and found that the result matched. So he writes in, he wrote a big book, in fact, uh, the first book on Indian astronomy written by uh, um, a, a European. He writes that Brahmanas make their astronomical calculations with a singular speed and ease without pen or pencil. They use instead cores, kinds of shells, which they align on a board as we do with our counters or often on the ground. This method of calculation seem to be, seems to be advantageous in that it is swifter and more expeditious than ours, but at the same time it has a big drawback. There is no way to go back on one's calculations, still less of saving them, since one has to erase them as one proceeds. If by ill luck one gets the result wrong, one has to start all over again. But they very rarely make mistakes. They work in a singularly composed, untroubled and calm manner, which we Europeans are incapable of, and which protects them from the errors which we would be unable to avoid in their place. It does seem that they and we must keep to our respective methods, and that theirs has been uniquely designed for them. 
the rules of astronomical calculations involve enigmatic verses which they know by heart. This is typically the kind of you know, verses that you find in the Siddhantas, which are formulas, basically, like what you find in Aryabhata or Brahmagupta and so on. They are just uh, uh, nothing but formulas expressed with words. <coughs> in that way, they have no need of tables of rules. By means of those verses, which they can be seen repeating as they go along, as we repeat our formulas, and of those quarries, they calculate eclipses of the sun and the moon with the greatest speed. The tables for the sun and the moon are written on palm leaves, cleanly cut to the same size. These are the famous palm leaf manuscripts of South India. They assemble them in kinds of booklets which they consult when they want to calculate an eclipse. They use a small stylet or owl to trace on those leaves whatever signs they wish. This stylet traces a slight but visible line by tearing the thin fin that covers the leaf. So this is about you know, how the Palmyrus manuscripts are written. And he goes on with many more observations. Uh, in fact, he was paying this uh, Pondicherry astronomer to teach him the method. But then he found at a certain point that this astronomer was deliberately trying to deceive him by teaching some false steps at a certain point. So anyway, he let him do, you know, whatever tricks he wanted. He got all the information and then he worked on it for a few months and he published in his French book, The Complete Method, which is basically, again, a series of algorithms. So this is a testimony by Le Gentil. What? No, this should not be here, sorry. Now we move to, after Bhaskaracharya, there is a kind of a gap. There are still, still some pockets of astronomers, especially in Maharashtra and around Varanasi or in Varanasi. But very often the class, I mean the classical perception was that after Bhaskaracharya, basically Indian science stopped. It's only in the 19th century, early 19th century, that one British scholar, his name was Wish, uh, W-H-I-S-H, published a paper on manuscripts he had seen uh, belonging to what we now call the Kerala School of Astronomy and Mathematics. There were some predecessors on the left side, but there is again a discontinuity and uh, uh, the exact connection is not very clear. But the founder of this school, one called uh, Madhava, uh, who, has, uh, who, uh, wor who published several works in his days, but all of them are lost except through uh, fairly long quotations at times, uh, found in the works of his disciples like Parameshwara, uh, Nilakanta, uh, Jeshtareva, and others. And you can see that um, this school goes on, in fact, till the 19th century. They are not exactly, the, the last two are not exactly innovators. Shankara Varma wrote a big book which is available. It's like, more like a summary of earlier results. So they're very useful to understand what the earlier uh, savants were doing but they are not really original contributions. You may say that by the, by the 16th century, the, the whole thing kind of comes to a stop. There is no further innovation. So what do they do? Well, the first, the first great innovation by Madhava was that for the first time, and this is the first time in the history of mathematics in the world, we have this uh, uh, sudden transformation of trigonometric series into uh, excuse me, trigonometric functions into infinite series. And uh, this was uh, 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 a great innovation. And in fact, these series are called uh, Gregory series, they are called Newton series, they are called Leibniz series, but all of them were worked out centuries earlier uh, in, in Kerala. And uh, of course, when, uh, uh, the f when you apply x equals 1 to the first, the top one, you get an expansion of pi. So now for the first time, uh, you see, I have not given you all the details, but this uh, hunt for the correct value of pi was going on throughout uh, the, the line of Siddhantic mathematicians as it was going on, in, in, as it went on in Europe later on. Uh, this is a very, it's a fundamental, pi is a fundamental constant, but what is it exactly? What is its value? Can we ever pin it down? So here now, Madhava understands that we will never pin it down because you can always have uh, some further fraction. 
And uh, he uses this to give, uh, uh, I think, some 10 decimals of pi, but then this is a very slowly converging series. And uh, later on, <coughs> this will be refined by later uh, mathematicians in the same Kerala school, where they will be not only uh, building up faster converging series, but they will also, when they decide to stop at a certain step in the series, suppose they have uh, taken uh, 20 fractions, and then it's becoming too tedious, so they don't want to calculate anymore, they will have an approximate value for the remainder beyond. So this is, it becomes very sophisticated work, and interestingly, this tradition will go on all the way to Ramanuja. Some of you might know that uh, uh, among all the theorems he gave, there are a series connected to pi, and he builds up some amazingly fast converging series. With just three, four steps, you can get a lot of correct decimals. So uh, this is, in a way, very much in this tradition. Nilakanta uh, Somayaji, who is the grand disciple, if we may say so, of Madhava, uh, continued uh, with uh, techniques of uh, expansions and uh, trigonometric functions. In particular, he showed, now this was building upon the work of Bhaskaracharya, who, as I said, introduced the notion of derivative. He showed that the differential of the sine is proportional to the cosine and vice versa. So this apparently is the first time. Uh, he gives interesting formulas for the sum of converging series, like this one, which is, of course, very well known, but to several others too. But then his great contribution is elsewhere. It is in a work called Tantra Sangraha, uh, which, is, uh, which was translated by, uh, recently by uh, some of the scholars we had here uh, last um, Friday, K. Uh, Ramasubramaniam, uh, M. D. Srinivas, and M. S. Sriram. Uh, they've done a critical edition of it uh, uh, with translations and annotations. And uh, they have shown that uh, he was uh, able to deal with the problem of the equation of centers of planets uh, in, in, a, in a way that was way ahead of Islamic or European astronomy. Let me explain what briefly what this involves. It involves the fact that by then they had recognized that the orbits of planets were not circles, or rather, they were not a, a circle concentric with the, the, the orbit of the sun around the Earth. So something was wrong. There was an eccentricity somewhere. And since they did not have the notion of an ellipse, they kind of <coughs> compensated uh, 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 by having this is, uh, uh, for example, the let us say that uh, this is the uh, orbit. This is, let us say, the center. This is the Earth, let us say, and this will be, uh, for example, uh, the, the orbit of the Earth and of the Sun around the Earth. <coughs> this is in the geocentric model. And this will be the center of the orbit of the whatever body you consider, like a planet, for example, which will not, so the two centers do not coincide. <coughs> and there was a big problem of calculating the second center uh, with relation to the center of the orbit of the sun. So this is known as the problem of the, uh, uh, the equation of the center. And he comes up with various calculation methods which clearly show that um, <coughs> Nilakanta is actually using a model where the planets are moving around the sun. In other words, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> We, ha we, we are not told, in fact, he doesn't say anything. It is not like, you know, Copernicus or later on Galileo <coughs> or Kepler who will explicitly say that uh, the <coughs> all the planets are going around the sun, beginning with the Earth. Here they don't make such statements. But from their, all their calculation methods, you can derive the model which they are actually using. And uh, the model is that the Earth is at the center. The Sun orbits the Earth, which in a way is perfectly valid. I mean, in physics, you can, you're free to take your frame of reference wherever you wish. And then he has 
the planets orbiting the sun, not orbiting the earth. So this is the major difference and this is basically equivalent to the uh, heliocentric system of Copernicus. So, so this is what I've just explained and um, uh, in fact Tycho Brahe, a Danish astronomer uh, very famous for his meticulous observations that were going to feed the work of uh, uh, astronomers like Copernicus and others, um, uh, he was able to give astonishingly precise observations. Uh, this, he was also using a comparable model where, in fact, this is the model of Tycho Brahe in, drawn in ancient uh, manuscript, European manuscript, where <coughs> this is uh, Solaris, if I'm not mistaken. So this is the, uh, no, this is the Earth. This is the Earth and this is the Sun. I think Solaris is written here. So the Sun orbits the Earth but then all the planets orbit the Sun and not the Earth. So this is the model which uh, coincidentally was worked out at the same time in India as in Europe. And, uh, <coughs> but uh, but uh, nevertheless uh, a few uh, decades before Copernicus as far as uh, Nilakanta is concerned. So this is a major innovation. It is now getting, this is the work of uh, the team I was <coughs> telling you about the three scholars who were here last week and uh, this is now increasingly recognized uh, by um, uh, historians of uh, world astronomy. Well there were also lots of other things but I think I'm going to skip because there are a few important uh, statements I want to discuss before uh, we reach the conclusion uh, but let me mention briefly that he refined the concept of bija samskara. What is bija? Bija means in astronomy a correction. <coughs> it means that all the, the acknowledgement that all their formulas which were based on algorithms were approximate. You see pre-calculus you cannot have a, 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 a exact formulas for the orbits of the, of the uh, planets or the celestial bodies. So they were working with basically algorithms that produce certain formulas but then they were approximate and <clears throat> the difference between the formula and the reality, the actual observation, would grow in uh, over time naturally because that uh, difference would accumulate. So they were actually adding to their formulas little bijas, corrective, corrective terms to catch up with this discrepancy. This is how they worked. In other words, they were very pragmatic. The, the Indian astronomers and mathematicians were very pragmatic. They were not very interested in theoretical models. They did not discuss theoretical models. Uh, in mathematics, they, did not, they were not interested in axiomatics, for example, what you know, Euclid and Greek mathematics was doing. They wanted good results. This is what Indian astronomers wanted above everything. So things that worked in practice. <coughs> And Nilakanta explains, but I'm not going to read it out, that we must be flexible and we must understand that the, the Siddhantas were correct at a certain time, but then things deviate and you have to introduce uh, uh, corrections uh, which will match the new observations so that in the end you have a new Siddhanta. So this is the very pragmatic approach of uh, uh, Indian mathematicians. I will. Um, just mentioned Jeshtadeva, his um, uh, Yukti Bhasha, uh, we had a very good talk about it uh, last week in that little workshop and uh, it's, it's a two volume book which uh, comes in the 16th century uh, and a very systematic kind of textbook for the students of those days which expound all the major results of mathematics and astronomy. So you have <coughs> here a, a, a formula for pi with, the, with precisely this kind of formula for the remainder which is left out when you decide to stop an infinite series. And uh, well here there is one interesting notion. You see there was a major reproach addressed to Indian science that Indian mathematicians in particular did not use the concept of proof. This was again and again reproached by Western historians of science because they were trained, you know, to, to 
uh, view Greek science as the ultimate perfection. And in Greek science, proof is, is everything. Euclid proceeds you know, from <coughs> axioms, builds up theorems, but then supplies proofs. Now, it is not quite true <coughs> that the Indians had no proof. They had a concept called upapati, which is not exactly a proof in the axiomatic sense, but a rationale. That is to say, a step-by-step -step demonstration, saying that <coughs> you can move to this step because of this, and, and so on. And finally, you get to the result. So they are almost as good as proof, but then they don't uh, integrate the concept of axioms. <coughs> Derivatives. Integrative procedures now are more and more frequent, <coughs> and uh, they are used to calculate areas and volumes of various solids. Uh, f let me just give you one simple example, which uh, again would be fun to introduce at the, the uh, school level. How do you demonstrate that the circumference <coughs> of a, th uh, that the area of a circle is what we know it is? Well, simply you split the circle into, into slices like this, into sec sectors rather, <coughs> and you assemble them in the following way. So you see this is the result of the assemblage of your circle. And then you simply have to imagine that your sectors are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So what happens, you can see that in that case this is going to tend towards a rectangle. <coughs> and what will be the area of the rectangle? It will be the side, which is the, the nothing but the radius of the circle, by the, uh, this, which is uh, half the perimeter. So, in other words, you can now establish the formula uh, without any difficulty. So, this is the kind of, you might call it pseudo-integral calculus. If you don't use, uh, you know, the formulas of integral calculus the way we, we would do it today, but it amounts to the same in a geometrical fashion. So, also the concept of limit. Yes, yes. The, the concept of limit was very clear in their minds. And they say, they do say, that you have to make this smaller and smaller. And then, of course, you have to use your imagination. So this is where it is, <coughs> we, we may call it pseudo -cal But it is calculus in a way. Now, I'm, I'm going now to a completely different uh, different aspects of Indian science after we have seen like the, the pinnacle which is uh, uh, basically Yukti Bhasha. They have been f they were further mathematicians and astronomers after them but they basically either expounded what was done by their predecessors or they refined certain techniques but they were, you, we don't have any other major um, innovations. <coughs> So, in fact, the, some historians of Indian historians of science, in particular one C.K. Raju, uh, even uh, um, um, you know, propounded the thesis that maybe some Jesuit uh, fathers coming to Kerala in the 16th century borrowed some manuscripts, and maybe those returning to Europe actually uh, inspired the work of Newton and Leibniz to, in, in setting up the the whole, the complete theory of calculus. Uh, they, they actually, Sikha Raju has put the theory in a very attractive form, but nevertheless, we don't have the actual historical evidence. At the end of the day, it remains an interesting speculation. Uh, we don't have a, any proof anywhere that Newton ever used, you know, a manuscript that would have been copied, f you know, from, from uh, ultimately an Indian source. So this is where matters end, but then there are other features of Indian science which I want to uh, dwell upon for a few minutes. <clears throat> First of all, the concept of time, and this concept of time was actually used in Indian astronomical texts. The Indian astronomers used usually the beginning of the Kali era as their starting point. They imagine that um, all planets were in conjunction at that time and they would calculate and they would tell you so many days since the beginning of the Kali era, even for, you know, to calculate uh, orbits of the planets today, for example. So they would carry those very cumbersome figures with them and this was based <coughs> on the traditional a uh, system of eras which is first expounded in the Mahabharata and um, uh, uh, possibly in a f couple of earlier texts. But uh, the concept of yuga 
uh, if you go to the most ancient texts, like Vedanga Jyotisha, it's a completely different concept. It's only five years. It's only a cycle of five years. So that cycle of five years in Vedanga Jyotisha grows and grows uh, in the later literature until you reach uh, this kind of concept. So you see here this uh, Chaturyuga for a million uh, 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 and three lakh twenty thousand years, <coughs> and then the universe basically is a, considered to be a day of Brahma, or if you want, you can also add a night of Brahma, which is a thousand such cycles, or for uh, 0.32 billion years. So this is the unit which, uh, uh, I mean, Indians uh, discussed as called the day of Brahma, and if you're going to add a night of Brahma, which is equal, you get to 8.6 four billion years and uh, interestingly it happens to be of the same order of magnitude as the age of the universe that astronomers today deal with they speak of 13.6 or 7 billion years so naturally we can take it to be a coincidence i'll come back to this in a few minutes and uh, the uh, american astronomer carl sagan in his book cosmos in fact has a little paragraph where he says that uh, <coughs> The Hindu religion was the only ancient religion which no doubt by accident, I mean he takes it as a, uh, an accident, he is of course free to do so because <coughs> there is apparently no, you know, no possible connection between the two processes uh, which no doubt by accident uh, come, reaches a scale of time uh, compatible with that of modern astronomy. So we'll come back to this in a moment, but first let me highlight the kind of time scale that Europe was dealing with all the way to the 19th century. You see, the, the, uh, the time scale was basically built on the Bible, and uh, there, was, there, were, there were a Jewish school of scholars, there was a Christian school, especially one uh, bishop called uh, Usher, who simply calculated, you know, in the, in the Old Testament, you have, starting from Adam, you have all, all the complete genealogies taking you all the way to historical kings like Salomon or semi-historical ones, but whose era is more or less known. So you can, you can simply back calculate and it's not very difficult to come to such dates. And this date, especially this one in Europe, was still Darwin. <coughs> And even after Darwin, for some uh, orthodox uh, uh, Christians, was considered to be the, the date of the creation of the universe. So we, you can see that we are moving in two completely different worlds from that point of view, at least, and uh, that uh, uh, the, the concepts are, are radically different. Uh, in, fact, in fact, it is not only time which is bounded in the European con concept, but the space was also bounded because you might remember in my uh, chart of Tycho Brahe, the Danish astronomer, you have a belt of stars which is actually the limit. The whole universe is a sphere, a closed sphere. The stars, and they're not very, very far away. Nobody knows really what they are. There is no way to tell. Even uh, uh, Indians also did not know what they are. The physical concepts of celestial bodies were very rudimentary in, in all cultures. Um, Indians uh, did mention several times, Aryabhata does it, uh, uh, Nilakanta also does it, they do mention that the moon does not produce a light of its own. It is nothing but the, the light reflected from the sun. Uh, and um, uh, the, uh, Aryabhata also mentions that the planets also do not produce light. They only reflect the light of the sun. So that's perfectly correct. But then he says the same thing of the stars. He said that the, the stars also, you know, Tara, uh, the stars also reflect the light of the sun. So obviously they, they do not have a proper physical concept of what things are. But here space is bounded, whereas for Aryabhata space is not. Uh, time is cyclic in the Indian concept, as we have seen. Uh, there is limited, endless space. There is, as I mentioned briefly last time, a fascination for large numbers. In fact, in the very early literature, you, I, I told you how Yajurveda names numbers all the way to, to 10 to the power of 12, but actually it continues later. And numbers uh, up to 10 to the power of 145 
in the existing literature had names, Sanskrit names. Now, you might say, what's the use? The answer is no use at all, except just for the fun of it, you know, for the pleasure of speculating endlessly, because the, 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 these numbers had absolutely no uh, practical use. But it's a fact that the concept of infinity underlies much of Indian science, and this is a cultural specificity. This is one thing which you do not find. Uh, Chinese mathematics, astronomy achieved quite a lot, but you will not find this kind of concern with the infinity. And I personally, I mean, it has been my thesis that uh, this uh, kind of the spiritual framework in which those uh, scientists were, were moving, I mean, the, the, the part of, it was part of the Indian culture of, of those days, is what drove them to look for the infinite also in their science. We saw Aryabhata the other day, you know, saying that contemplating the orbits of the planets and the stars uh, uh, will lead you to the realization of the Supreme Brahman. So it's not just the infinite. You have the other end of things, you know, the infinitesimal. That also they wanted to explore. Now, how do you explore that? You cannot easily explore it when you have no microscope. So they would create, first of all, intellectually, they would create units, like endlessly small units of, in this, of dimension, for example, you have the paramanu, the atom, and its size is given in some text. I think this one comes actually from Bhaskaracharya. And uh, they tell you, well, so many of them, and of course it's through a whole scale of units, which I'm not repeating here to save time. Uh, but the, you have a whole scale building up to, from the Paramanu to the Angula, which I told you the other day is the width of the middle finger, and then of course beyond. So when you calculate, you come to about uh, 70 nanometers. Uh, so this is still much too large for an atom, but I mean, this is an interesting scale. Um, Bhaskaracharya also goes into a whole range of units of time, and the first and smallest of them is called the truti, and this is its definition. So when you calculate again, it's 30 microseconds. Uh, again, what possible use, uh, to my knowledge, no, not, not at all. Even in Charaka Samhita, you have lots of definitions of units, especially of weight, because you're going to use weights to prepare the medicines. But then it starts also from one ba basic weight, the dhamshi, which is uh, uh, around uh, one tenth of a milligram, and I don't believe that this would have been used in any possible fashion. So, so this is clearly, uh, and it doesn't stop there. Whatever system of units you take, for example, for measuring angles, the, the Indians used the degree. There's a bit of a controversy whether they borrowed the de concept of 360 degrees from the Babylonians or not. Anyway, let's leave that aside because we can never have firm answers. So they would have the degree and then they would divide the degree into 60 units, that's the minute, and divide the minute into 60 further units, that's the second. But why stop there? They would divide it further into 60, um, uh, it's called Tatpara, and that's still further into 60 pratapara. So uh, obviously those units cannot be used. So this is how they, this is how they, they explored. But then uh, anyway, I'll come to, I'll come back to this in a minute. Uh, there were other fascinating branchings out of science into the society in unexpected ways. Uh, now it's very well known that there are a lot of astronomical alignments in temples, for example. This has been uh, fairly well documented. But then you also find astronomy in very unexpected places. For example, in this uh, map of Varanasi. Uh, this is the work of one uh, American astrophysicist, John McKim Malville, who specialized in archaeoastronomy, that is to say the uh, astronomy of ancient civilizations. And ancient civilizations, you know, needed, felt the need which today we have kind of lost, to be constantly correlated to the universe in one way or another. So I told you in past lectures, you know, how the temple has to be a symbol of the cosmos. The, even the humble brick fire altar is a symbol of the cosmos. And this is a kind of vital need for ancient man in all ancient cultures. So when he came to India and he worked with a number of um, uh, Indian scholars, 
they visited sites like Hampi, like Chitrakut, like, and they found unexpected astronomical alignments everywhere. Now, I, I don't have time to show it all, but the most striking to me was in Varanasi, where they, as you know, Varanasi is dedicated to the worship of the sun, and this takes the form of the Adityas. The Adityas are Vedic deities, which are of a solar nature, and there are f uh, uh, 14 or 13 of them, depending as how you count them. And they knew that there was this tradition, this is all they knew, and all that the, the scholars of Varanasi also knew, that there was a tradition of worship of the Adityas, and they used to be small temples which had been demolished at the time of the uh, Islamic invasions, but then people, as always, re you know, preserved those spots by having a, usually a small niche in a wall or, or some s very small shrine on the ground. Uh, they spent three weeks interviewing a lot of uh, senior scholars in Varanasi to locate all these because the locations were half forgotten most of the time. And when they mapped those locations and they drew these lines, they found, I don't know if you can read, that let us stay from, um, from this point on, uh, this is f the, the sunrise at, uh, on 14th January, uh, Makara Sankranti. Then if you go be below 14th December, 14th November, 14th October, etc. And if you go above, you will have 14th February, 14th March, etc. It goes on. So there is, in fact, a desire. So those who mapped those initial Aditya shrines wanted, in fact, the whole city to be a kind of a, I mean, a kind of a calendar, you know. The, the whole city had to become a calendar on the ground. And again, this is something that serves no practical purpose whatsoever. It would not be useful as an observatory, for example. You cannot use it like that. But it is simply a cultural desire to, you know, to connect yourself to the cosmos in one way or the other. So there are other ways, like uh, this uh, concept of the Dashavatar, the ten avatars of Vishnu, where you start uh, uh, from the fish, and then the tortoise, and then the boar, finally the uh, Narasimha, the half animal, half man, then you have the sh short man, dwarf, and then a kind of brutish man, this is Parashurama, you remember? And then, of course, we move to uh, more advanced, especially spiritually speaking, uh, levels of humanity. So if you look at it, it is a kind of, uh, as Sri Aurobindo once said, it is a parable of evolution. It is not as some, again, some, you know, always, you always have um, enthusiasts who will rush to conclusions like we knew Darwinian evolution before Darwin. Well, it's not exactly like that. Uh, there is no explicit, um, there is an explicit concept of evolution of the soul, like the soul in the Puranas, if you read, you know, so many births as, an, as a plant and then so many as an animal, so many as a Shudra, of course it has to follow the caste system and so uh, until you reach the state of uh, Brahmanhood. So again it is a kind of an image, but then this concept of evolution is there, but not as far as uh, we cannot speak of evolution of species, that would be quite uh, overstretching this. Nevertheless, <coughs> the fact that <coughs> we have the fish, the reptile, the mammal, the, the intermediary between the mammal and man and, and so on is striking enough. So there is a kind of an intuition uh, of this concept. That's all we can say. There are riddles here and there also, and I'll show you one or two more before I conclude. <coughs> like this hymn to, the, to Surya in the Rig Veda. It's a very simple hymn, there's nothing special about it. But Sayana, who was a commentator of the Rig Veda in the Vijayanagara Empire in the 14th or 15th century, comments on this hymn. And his comment is very odd. And he says, it is remembered, Smaryate. So it's an ancient tradition according to him, but there's no trace of it in the text we have at our disposal. As I said, there are many manuscripts that are waiting to be read, so maybe one day we'll find some further evidence. Anyway, he says, it is remembered that the sun, Surya, traverses the sky 
2,202 yojanas in half a nimesha. Now, these units are known. The yojana is 8,000 average height of a man. This is how it is defined uh, in most of the Siddhantic literature. Then the nimesha is 1675th of a second. This is how it is in, in the scale of time units. So when you work it out, you come to 2,80,000 kilometers per second. Now this is extremely strange. What does it mean? Uh, we, the astronomers in those days knew very well that the sun was not traveling at that kind of a speed through the sky. So what do they mean? Well, people again have said, well, it means that we knew the speed of light. Uh, we, it's very difficult to decide because we are in the pre-telescopic era and two, you know, the first observation of the speed of light was done by Roma on uh, dif differences in the orbits of the moons of Jupiter take, uh, from, seen from one end of the orbit and at the other end of the orbit. And he could calculate the difference and work out the speed of light, which he got at about 20% accuracy but this was in uh, this was uh, at least 200 years later so can the speed of light be calculated in to observe through any method non telescopic method i very much doubt i think it is not possible so if they meant the speed of light it means they got it in some other way if they don't mean the speed of light then what do they mean it's open to discussion i have no particular answer to offer but i want to list some of these coincidences because, you know, Carl Sagan said, no doubt by accident. So let's see a few accidents. So this is the, the accident that Carl Sagan mentions, that the day and night of Brahma is more or less of the order of magnitude of the actual thing. I have demonstrated in a small, uh, very simple calculation that uh, an orbit of the sky given by Aryabhatta, he, he says this is the orbit of the sky. And uh, then there is a commentary which says this is not the end of the sky because it is endless. This is only as far as the um, light of the sun can go. And I've demonstrated that it is actually very close to the distance to which the sun ceases to be visible to the naked eye. So it's another coincidence, let us say. Space is without limit. Time has no beginning or end. Well, these are concepts that uh, physicists understand. We've seen Sayana's comment, but there are other things which are very strange. There is explicitly in, in the ancient Indian literature the concept of microorganism. This is there in the Mahabharata, for example, very clearly, where one uh, Markandeya ridicules the concept of Ahimsa. He says those who defend Ahimsa are fools in Mahabharata. Because whether you like it or not, the simple fact of breathing destroys a lot of organisms that are swarming in the air. Now, how do they know? Forget about the, uh, the, the, the critique of Ahimsa, but how do they know that there are microorganisms in the air? And in texts of Ayurveda, particles in the blood, corpuscles in the blood, are described as invisible coppery in color, that is red, reddish, legless, and circular. Now, if this is not a good description of the red corpuscles, I don't know what it is. Those, those, I have the Sanskrit uh, shloka for anybody who wants. Invisible, circular, legless, and coppery. So, how do they know these things? And this becomes very, I mean, uh, if you say that this is a coincidence, yes, of course, you, you can say. But then how do they give such specific descriptions of things which are visible only to the microscope? We have no answer. Concept of evolution. Then recently somebody noticed, uh, in fact, um, it is a friend of mine, Dr. Ram Manohar, uh, Ayurvedic doctor, that um, there was a paper, I think in Nature, a couple of years ago, trying to list all species existing on Earth, all. Uh, animal species, plant species, everything. And they came up, this paper came up with a figure of about 8.7 million species. But then there is a giant text which says, long back, 8.4 million. So that's another accident for you. So it raises some question whether, you know, they had, uh, if they could not, and they could not have come through these figures and this concept through scientific methods, because the scientific methods did not exist. 
So is there another way through which they could have, and I'll take a few minutes uh, before I conclude. Uh, well, there are, there are things which we can understand. We call them intuition. Mathematicians know that if you don't have intuition, you're never going to be a good mathematician. Uh, there are, of course, special cases like Ramanujan here, S. Ramanujan, who, you know, when asked how he was getting all these theorems in such rapid uh, 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 form, and uh, sometimes, you know, they, they just came to him like that, uh, sometimes he had to work hard for them also. Uh, his answer to a friend of his was that they were sent to him by the family goddess, you know, the Kula, Kula Devata, and uh, she was named Namagiri. So his biographer just mentions it and without further comment, because what can you say? You know, this is what he says. But I want to mention two cases. One is Swami Vivekananda, who met Nikola Tesla in New York in 1896. And Vivekananda was somebody who was intellectually, let us keep aside his spiritual side, who was very curious and very abreast of developments. And in fact, he talked to Tesla about possible connections between Vedanta and physics. And he showed how, uh, uh, you know, Vedantic prana and akasha uh, could be, you know, uh, parallel with modern concepts in physics. And then Tesla came up with, you know, he was quite enthused by all that. So uh, Vivekananda himself writes in a letter <coughs> that uh, Mr. Tesla thinks he can demonstrate mathematically that force and matter are reducible to potential energy. Force and matter. I am to go and see him next week to get this new mathematical demonstration. In that case, the Vedantic cosmology will be placed on the surest of foundations. Now, uh, within a week, Tesla did not uh, do it, and I don't know what happened later on. It was, of course, Einstein who, uh, late, a few years later, just uh, nine years later, was going to come up with the equivalence between energy and matter. But it was there strongly in Vivekananda's mind. So there, there are obviously perceptions which can be used in the scientific field. This example now here is even more striking. This is Sri Aurobindo discussing <coughs> matter with Pavitra, who was actually a French disciple who had done Ecole Polytechnique. So he was extremely well versed in mathematics and physics. And he had just reached Pondicherry and he was being accepted as a disciple. But then he had, in those days, it was still possible to have private interviews with Sri Aurobindo, not afterwards. And he put a lot of questions to him, which were published in his own <coughs> notebooks. So Sri Aurobindo says, there are two observations of modern science. We are in 1926. Please remember nuclear fission and, uh, uh, of course, fusion. But fission, first of all, is not yet clear at all among uh, nuclear scientists or quantum physicists. This is going to happen in the 1930s. And it's only in the late 1930s that Fermi, uh, uh, Enrico Fermi, if I remember well, uh, this um, Italian-born physicist will create the first nuclear uh, water. It was not yet called a reactor, but where fission reactions will be happening. So 26, he says, <coughs> two observations of modern science that would strike a deep chord in an occultist. One, atoms are whirling systems like the solar system. Two, the atoms of all <coughs> elements are made up of the same constituents. Different arrangements are the only cause of different properties. So you can see that Sri had grasped some scientific principles. And then he says, if these observations were considered under their true aspect, they could lead science to new discoveries of which it has no idea at present, and in comparison with which the present knowledge is poor. According to the experience of the ancient yogis, Agni is threefold. In fact, Agni in Rig Veda, there are three Agnis. Ordinary fire, Jala Agni, electric fire, Vaidyutta Agni, and solar fire, Sora Agni. Science only entered upon the first and the second of these fires. The fact that the atom is like the solar system could lead to the knowledge of the third. Now, that third fire, <coughs> or solar fire, solar fire is nothing but uh, nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear energy, uh, fusion and fission uh, happening together. So it's very striking here because we have such a precise, which is rare, of course, such a precise uh, uh, enunciation 
of what he had perceived through his own means, which obviously were not scientific means, this is useful to me because it gives us a clue as to how some of the ancient uh, savants uh, could come up with some of those striking accidents which I mentioned. So this is just, of course, uh, slightly speculating, but um, it's interesting. I think I'm going to take exceptionally a few more minutes to simply uh, mention, but I've already done it uh, partly, uh, that um, India's contributions uh, were very considerable, especially in, in mathematics, uh, the decimal system, but also a lot of algebra. This was uh, conveyed to the Western world through the Arab world, and especially this house of wisdom created by a, a, a broad-minded caliph in the 9th century in Baghdad, where all kinds of ancient texts in Greek it, and uh, uh, Sanskrit were translated into Arabic and Persian. This is where the famous al khwarizmi for example, worked. And he had access to the text, Indian texts, especially Brahmagupta, and wrote several texts of algebra based on them. And he fully acknowledged, in fact, one of his books is called the, <coughs> I forget the Arabic uh, title, is called The uh, Mathematics of uh, Hind. So uh, then these were further translated into Latin and uh, went into Europe. And this is actually what created the rebirth of mathematics in Europe. So India has a contribution in this sense. In fact, it's very interesting that the world algorithm, and as I've been stressing again and again, Indians were very good at creating excellent algorithms in mathematics and astronomy, is nothing but a, a European corruption of al khwarizmi al khwarizmi Latinized became al algorithmi. So this is how uh, uh, the word algorithm derives. But there's another side to this encounter, which is less happy, and which is given to us by Al-Biruni, who accompanied Mahmud of Ghazni in the 11th century to India. And he says, it's in, I'll take just half a minute, he says that um, Al-Biruni found Hindus, he, he, I quote, niggardly in communicating that which they know. He was very interested in astronomy in particular, and he wanted to get all the knowledge that the Brahmins could give him. But then he complains that Brahmins think that there is no country like theirs, but theirs, no nation like theirs, no kings like theirs, no religion like theirs, no science like theirs. So those Indians are so proud. Things have changed, of course, nowadays. <laughs> we would not <coughs> um, make such statements. But this is given by al -Biruni, so therefore we can't dispute it. And then he says, Mahmud of Ghazni utterly ruined the prosperity of the country and performed these wonderful exploits by which the Hindus became like atoms of dust scattered in all directions. This is the reason too, and this is very important because this is what we saw on the map I showed you the other day where the mathematicians and astronomers retreat to the south as time passes. This is the reason too why Indian sciences have retired far away from those parts of the country conquered by us and have fled to places where, which our hand cannot yet reach. So when we discuss this question, why did Indian science fail to mature into modern science, which is a question very often asked, uh, this in fact is to me the major reason that the centers of learning were destroyed, like for example, Nalanda University and many others, which had huge collections of manuscripts. The scholars were scattered like atoms of dust, as al -Biruni tells us. And you cannot have science in such an environment. For science to prosper, you need networks of scholars. And those Indian scholars were always communicating very closely together from north to south, east to west. You can see through the commentaries, you can see how one scholar from one region is aware of the work of all the others. So this is possibly the major reason. Uh, one reason which has been invoked is that science received less patronage than the arts. And um, it is true that the kings were more prone to uh, you know, patronizing poets that sung their praise, um, artists that would you know, create beautiful pieces of architecture, all far more tangible to them than the, the, <coughs> uh, the, the purely uh, scientific speculations. Um, there was, of course, no time to, for, the, for Indian science, or what was left of it, to try to rebuild its own network and therefore its own field. 
before European science entered the, uh, India in the late 18th century. So uh, by this time it was too late. So therefore uh, there was no further uh, contribution. One factor also which has been pointed out by some scholars, and I agree to some extent, is that the, the uh, in European science pro was very largely promoted by colonialism. Colonialism demanded technologies, shipping technologies quite a lot of course, and therefore astronomy, but also technologies like uh, military technologies, uh, uh, the development of weapons and so on. So there was a great spur given to the development of science and technology in the colonial era in Europe. There was no you know, colonial era in, in India. I mean, India never went out to colonize and therefore this kind of impetus or incentive was, uh, did not exist uh, uh, in India. There was <clears throat> no need actually to go through an industrial revolution the way Europe did. So this also played a part. It's a very open-ended question. There are lots of other factors that can be considered. But, well, yes, there is at the end of the day, especially at the end of the Kerala school, a certain uh, stagnation taking place. And then, of course, uh, European com uh, science comes in and uh, occupies the space. But let us not forget that European science is not European. <coughs> it is a confluence of streams borrowed from the Arabs and Persians and therefore the, from the Indians through them. From China, a few elements also were borrowed. The, the, the China, uh, European travelers to China were documenting Chinese science as early as the 15th uh, uh, century. Uh, from <coughs> uh, uh, um, possibly, uh, I mean, of course, from Babylonia, Mesopotamia through the Greeks. So it is a confluence. And therefore, uh, of course, when the Renaissance took place, then uh, uh, European scientists uh, broke a lot of new ground, but then they were building on foundations which had been contributed by non-Western sources. Thank you very much, and please excuse the, this very long lecture. <laughs>